Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Jack Rubin's The Indestructible Julia, starring Katina Paxinou on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars and outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we are doing something we did once before, and it turned out rather happily. That is, we are presenting a story especially written for radio by one of our valued writers for the Hallmark Playhouse. Mr. Jack Rubin has helped us so much during the past year by his excellent adaptations of the work of others that to present a story of his own gives us a great deal of pleasure, and especially because the one he's written for tonight has such a strong human appeal. It's called The Indestructible Julia, and this is the first time it's been done on the air. Julia, I think you'll agree, faced her problems with perhaps the best equipment anyone can have, a cool head and a warm heart. And to play this role, we are privileged indeed to have one of our finest actresses, Miss Katina Paxinou, whose recent screen performance so richly deserved the Academy Award which it won. And now, a word about Hallmark Cards from Frank Goss, before we begin the first act of The Indestructible Julia. There are Hallmark Cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying Hallmark on the back, well, that says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Jack Rubin's The Indestructible Julia, starring Katina Paxinou. For over 20 years, Julia Pafko, aged 45, who had been born in the wonderful old Greek city of Athens, had lived on Long Island, and there had raised her late sister's three children, Rob, Francie, and Alice. And it hadn't been an easy job, for Julia was just the average working woman whose livelihood depends on a salary. But, being the indestructible Julia, somehow she managed to get by, and of course the children learned to lean on her, and she was always there when they needed her. Naturally, she hadn't the time for romance, so now she was resigned to a life of spinsterhood. But fate has a way of taking a hand in the scheme of things, and it did just that for Julia on the Long Island Railroad platform. Bombato, don't close the door. I don't want to miss the train. Look, my heels caught in this platform vent. Sorry, but this train runs on schedule, lady. Oh, I'll be late for work. You can't do that to me. All aboard. Oh, please. Oh, well, it looks like you're going to miss the 7.55. It's not funny. Get on the train and leave me alone. Well, there are two of us left at the post now. Here, let me have a look at that shoe. It's caught in the van. Well, if I were you, I'd stop tugging on it. The heel's liable to come off. Well, how am I going to get it out if I don't? Well, it might be a good idea if you stepped out of the shoe. Then I could sort of ease it out carefully. Well, that's a good idea. Now watch closely and see how I do it. When I get through, you'll never know it was ever in trouble. You have to be gentle about these things, that's all. <clears throat> there, there's your shoe. Yes, but where is the heel? Yes. <laughs> well, it's like I always say, you have to be gentle about these things. I'm sorry. What am I going to do now? Listen, I've got a great idea. As good as the last one? Oh, better. This one can't miss. I hope so. Well, you'll see. First, we'll have a cup of coffee together, and then we'll go to the shoemaker and have him put on a new heel. <laughs> Rob, 
How many times have I told you I don't like you talking like a jitterbug? Hmm. You're a college graduate. Come on, baby. A kiss is a kiss in any language. Tilt your head a little and smooch. Oh. <laughs> What's the use? Oh, there's no doubt about it. You're the best little smoocher in the business. Likely saying your language. You are pretty happy yourself, kiddo. <laughs> is dinner ready, Alice? Already? How could it be? You said you were going to bring a chicken home tonight. Aunt Julia, that's not like you. What happened today? Nothing, Alice. Nothing that has happened every day. All right, Aunt Julia. From the beginning. Honest, there is nothing to tell. We're waiting. Oh, it's no use. You can't keep a secret in this house. Well, the first thing this morning, I had trouble with a heel. Lead me to him and I'll tear him apart. Oh, <laughs> and because of the heel, I met a gentleman. What a triangle. What was his name? His name? Yes, his name. Oh, his name. Oh, I forgot to ask. Oh, oh Aunt oh. Julia. Oh, what is this, anyhow? An inquisition? I'm not interested in the man. Even if I wanted to be, I, I wouldn't have the time. I've got you three to worry about. And believe me, that's enough of a headache. Oh, I'll <laughs> bet, Aunt Julia, he liked you. Fancy, fancy. There are so many young girls in this world she can choose from. Why should she run after me? <laughs> No, Miss. Miss Pafko, Julia Pafko. Julia. Mm-hmm. You mind if I sit next to you? No, not at all. I've been taking the 755 now for over a year, and I've noticed you... I've noticed you very often, in fact. I like you in blue. It's, it's very becoming, your best color. But I'm not wearing blue today. But you did last Tuesday. <laughs> You're very observant. <laughs> Please, what's your name? Fred Blake. I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself before. Believe me, I didn't mean it. Well, there's nothing uh, that is casual about our talking together like this. I don't make a habit of... I'm sure of that, Mr. Blake. Thanks. I've seen you on this train so often, I can't help thinking we've been friends for a long oh. time. Yes, one learns so many little things about people around them on a train. <laughs> for instance? Uh, well... You always wear a bow tie, Mr. Blake. You mean you noticed? And you are also interested in the stock market. <laughs> oh, now, now, wait a minute. Are you a mind reader, Not too? quite. And as soon as you take your seat across the aisle, you always open your paper to the financial section. Well, what else do you know about me? You are a difficult man, Mr. Blake. Difficult? Mm-hmm. You are very strong-willed. Whenever I come on the train, I play a game. I look at the back of your head and say to myself, by the time I count ten, he'll turn around. By the time I count ten, he'll turn around. <laughs> and I don't? No. I usually have to count to 25. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've played that very same game with you, Miss Bafko, but you're absolutely heartless. Why couldn't I make you turn around? Perhaps you didn't concentrate strongly enough, Mr. Oh, Blake. Oh, <laughs> but I did. I never wanted anyone to turn around so much in my whole life. Well. It's true. You know so much about me, and I know so little about you. There isn't much to tell. I live in a small apartment on Cliff Street with three wonderful children. Children? Mm-hmm. Well, you said before... Oh, there are my sister's children, oh. but I have raised them since they were very small. Rob, he's the oldest, and he's going to be a big businessman. Oh. Mm-hmm. He's a college graduate, you know. And Alice, she's the youngest. If I told you she was another Lily Pond, would you believe me? I'd believe anything you tell me. <laughs> Why, you said that as if you meant it. I do. But tell me, what about the third one? Fancy? Yes. Oh, she's a homegirl. She's in love with a boy by the name of Johnny. She dreams of a beautiful house on a hill. And... Oh. <sighs> Why am I telling you all this? Because I want to know everything about you and your family. Everything. <laughs> Aunt 
Julia, I'm going to give up my singing lessons. What did you say, Alice? Professor Giorgino feels I should go to Italy to continue my studies. And, well, where is the money to come from? Never mind. You'll go to Italy. And very soon. Look, Rob. Here's a few dollars. I want you to buy a new shirt and a tie and... Oh, what's the use? A guy goes to college and gets a degree and the best offer he can get is as a gas station attendant. You won't be a gas station attendant. I won't let you. Oh, it, it's Johnny. We can't get married. He isn't making enough money. If you both moved into our apartment, you'd be able to manage. But there isn't room enough now. We'll make room. This way, sir. celebrating an anniversary tonight. I know. It's two months since I missed the train. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to propose a toast. Here's to the man who built the vent that trapped your shoe. May he have all the happiness he's given me. I'm grateful to him, too. Will you marry me, Julia? We can have a good life together. Fred, I'm leaving for San Francisco in a few days on business, and I may never come back again. San Francisco is a wonderful place to spend a honeymoon. Please, Fred. I'm a good companion, a sympathetic listener. I have a fairly even disposition. I... I've been a pretty lonely guy until you came along. The only thing I can add is that I love you. I love you very much, Julia. Will you marry me? I... I can't. Why? Why can't you? Why? Maybe I'm a fool. I, I don't know. The children, they still need me. Not half as much as I do. Please, please, try to understand. I only me. understand that they're not children any longer. They're grown up and able to take care of themselves. Listen to me, Fred. I want your kind of happiness. Because, because it's the most worthwhile happiness I could ever have. I don't think I haven't given it a great deal of thought. Let me confess something to you. From the very beginning, I... I had daydreams. I almost felt a little... <laughs> ridiculous. Like a romantic schoolgirl. <laughs> I'd say to myself, what if he should ask me to marry him? I was almost afraid to hope. But, but, but you see, the children, they need me. Their lives are all upset and, well, I've never been able to leave a job half done. I, I couldn't do it. I don't know what to say, Julia. Forgive me, Fred, but that's the way I've always been. And I suppose it is too late to change now. I... I seem to have the habit of missing the train. I guess... I guess I've just missed the most important one of my life. second act of The Indestructible Julia, starring Katina Paxinu. I have a riddle for you tonight. Can you tell me what it is that you never buy for yourself, but only to send to others? Perhaps you didn't realize just how unselfishly you shop when you buy greeting cards. For you do buy greeting cards only for others. That's why you want the finest. And if you'll ask any group of friends what name they think of in greeting cards when they want to send the very best, I'm sure you'll receive the same answer I did. 
Hallmark cards. For people have found that the words on Hallmark cards have a sincere, wonderful way of expressing their own thoughts and feelings to others. Whether it's a gay message of congratulations, a quiet word of sympathy, or just a friendly hello, there's always a Hallmark card to say just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And so it is easy to remember, it would be difficult to forget, to look for that Hallmark on the back of every card you choose when you care enough to send the very best. And now back to James Hilton in the second act of The Indestructible Julia, starring Katina Paxinou. month had passed, and Johnny and Francie were about to be married. As for Julia, although she believed she'd put Fred out of her life, the memory of him was ever present. And now, as Alice's lovely voice filled the small church, random thoughts and memories came tumbling into Julia's mind. I wish Fred were here. Fred, thanks for giving me two months of knowing you. They were the happiest in my life. Francie and Johnny, Rob, Alice. Why is it so many different emotions get mixed together at a wedding? I feel like crying and laughing. I'm, I'm happy and I'm sad. Oh, promise me. Alice, beautiful. She got her first thing in Latin seven years ago. What a little handful she was that day. I won't sing for him. He's the meanest man in the world. You're behaving like a prima donna. Why, you have never even seen Professor Giorgino. Oh, yes, I have. I saw his picture in the paper. Ugh. I am uh, Mr. Ugg. Oh, oh, hello, Professor. Say hello to the Professor Alice, darling. My what? She already did. Well, uh, thanks anyway, Professor. We are sorry to have bothered you. Come on, Alice. No, 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 no. Wait. Young lady, you with the curls, run the scales for me. Oh! Aha! Excellent temperament. <laughs> All right, Nana, come over to me, little one. Don't be afraid of me. I won't hurt you. Well, if you worried about the picture in the paper, I never saw such a horrible-looking man myself. You know, even I was afraid. Uh, perhaps, Professor, I ought to bring her back another time. No, no, no. I like her. Uh, professor, before you listen to her, we aren't rich. So? But you mustn't think we want charity. Young lady, the scale, please. The scale, please. Professor Giorgino didn't believe in charity. His fee was $25 a lesson, and he charged us only $1. Here comes the bride. Here, in a few minutes, Francie will be married. She looks like an angel in her wedding gown. How worried she was about a gown on that first date with Johnny, four years ago. Come on now, Francie. It's getting late. Into the shower you go. Oh, why bother? I might as well stay home tonight. All the other girls who will be at the dance bought their dresses at the best stores, and, and I have to wear some kind of a hodgepodge. Johnny will be ashamed of me. It's very wonderful to be 16 your age. There's so much to look forward to. But 16 or 60, any age, holds its little disappointments. And when things don't turn out our way, we just can't break down and cry and begin pitying ourselves. The thing to do is to try to make the next thing better. Why do you put up with me, Aunt Julia? I'm just about the most ungracious, ungrateful wretch. Have a surprise for you, dear. Open that closet. <gasps> oh, Aunt Julia! Where did this gown come from? Oh, oh it's scrumptious. <laughs> did oh. you think I'd let you go to the dance in an old hutch? Oh, wait till Johnny sees it. Just wait till Johnny sees it. And Julia, wait till Johnny. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here 
in the sight of God to join together this land. Good advice. I told her not to pity herself, but I've been doing it since the moment friend, Fred and I parted. There's Rob standing at the altar, so strong and handsome. Yet, on that July 4th, so many years ago, we almost lost him. Why should God do this to him? Why should he want to take Rob away from us? Oh, Aunt Julia. He'll be all right, Francie. But just look at him. He's burning up. How can you say he's going to be all right? I have faith. In who? In God. You do? Then why doesn't he send a doctor here? Why even wouldn't he have been able to reach a doctor all night? How can you stand there and tell me you have faith? Because I've believed in him all my life. And so have you, Francie. God will look after Rob. I'm going out to find a doctor. That's all I know. Father in heaven, with all my heart and soul, I entreat you to save his life. But your will, not mine, be done. Within the hour, the doctor came. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. You've been so good to us. And as long as I live, as long as Rob or Francie or Alice need me, I shall be at their side. It could never be different. Sit down, Aunt Julia. I made the coffee this morning especially for you. It's hard to wait, Rob. I want to get Francie and Johnny's room ready before I leave for work. Well, you don't need to. We had a little talk, and Francie and Johnny decided they'd be happier to be away from here. I can't believe that. You know, they can't afford it. They can now. Francie's going to work and help Johnny instead of wasting her time at home. But she could live here and not have to work. She's aware of that. And, Aunt Julia, Alice isn't going to Italy this year. What did you say? I showed her the note you were going to sign at the bank, which would make it possible for her to go. She tore it up. This is ridiculous. This is absurd. Rob, you oh, don't... please, don't stop me. I'm not finished yet. Aunt Julia, I'm a working man. You are working? Where? At the biggest gas station on Long Island. No. No, I won't have it. Oh, believe me, it's for the best. Sure, I'd like to start as president of an oil company, but since it can't happen that way, I'm willing to work my way up and wait a little while until I become president. You know something? I'm a lucky guy to be living in a country where it could happen. But all your lives, you've come to me and talked things over, and... Oh, Aunt Julia, can't you understand? For years, you've been the most thoughtful mother in the world, and we, Francie, Alice, and myself, we've been thoughtless. Well, that's ended. We're not going to lean on you any longer. In a sense, we're not going to need you. Not need me? Oh, don't misunderstand. Our love for you will go on forever. Nothing could change that. But as for now, you're a free woman who doesn't have to look after three selfish brats. Now, now, where did all these ideas come from? Oh, that's where you come into the picture. Ever hear of a man called uh, Fred Blake? Fred? What's Fred got to do with this? Oh, everything. He wrote me a letter and told me what he thought of the whole caboodle of us, and that includes you. Aunt Julia, I'm ashamed of you. I thought I taught you better. How could you let a guy like that off the hook? Just how selfish could you be? Selfish? Of course. How could you deprive us of the pleasure of an uncle? After all, we have a wonderful aunt, and just imagine how nice it would be if we had a wonderful uncle. Where is... Where is Fred? Well, his letter said he's on his way from San Francisco. He could be anywhere between here and there. Have a cup of coffee, beautiful. I made it especially for you. Make it a big cup, Rob. I need it. <laughs> Well, go on, get it out. Oh, oh, the train. Thank you. I don't want to miss the train. I don't know what it is today, but so many unusual things are happening. The world seems so much brighter. Hey, 
Why are you stepping out of your shoe? Ah, just watch me closely. First, I carefully jiggle the shoe back and forth, like this. See? You just have to be gentle about these things. That's all. Well, here's my shoe. Yes, my darling, but where's the heel? Fred! Oh, Fred! Oh, Fred! Julia. Julia. Oh, boy. Julia, the 755. Goodbye, Sandarto! Dearest, you missed the train. Oh, no, darling. As long as you're near me, I'll never miss the train again. Don't ever leave me. Don't ever leave me, Fred. Paxineau and James Hilton will return in a moment. You may remember I told you about the exhibition of prize-winning paintings in the International Hallmark Art Award. I reported its world premiere in New York, then its opening in Boston, the beginning of a tour of principal cities of the United States. Now the exhibition has moved to Washington, D.C. The formal opening will take place tomorrow in the Corcoran Gallery of Art, and the exhibition will be open to the public March the 4th. If you are in Washington, you are cordially invited to see this exhibition of 70 paintings by French and American artists, winners of the $28,000 in prizes given by the makers of Hallmark cards in the International Hallmark Art Award. You will probably see news stories of the exhibition, for it is one of the outstanding art events of modern times, with the high purpose of stimulating the fine art of two nations and broadening public appreciation of art. Here again is James Hilton. That was fine, Katina Paxinou. Our Hallmark Playhouse has been honored by your excellent portrayal of Julia. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. It was wonderful to be here with you. You Hallmark people know how to make even a stranger feel as if uh, she were an old friend. I'm glad to hear you say that, because, you know, we like to think that friendliness is a Hallmark Playhouse tradition. Just like your wonderful Hallmark cards. They also have a gift for making friends and for helping to keep them, too. But tell me, Mr. Hilton, what are you going to do next week? I always look forward to Hallmark Playhouse. It's wonderful. Next week, we shall present Alfred Leland Crabbe's Home to the Hermitage. It's a story of General Andrew Jackson's stormy political career and also a love story, one I think you'll remember. Our star, I'm very pleased to announce, will be Burgess Meredith. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was by Jack Rubin. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. <laughs> for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, the part of Fred was played by Tom Tully. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when James Hilton returns to present Burgess Meredith in Alfred Leland Crabbe's Home to the Hermitage and the week following, Charles O'Neill's The Three Wishes of Janie McRuin starring Richard Todd. And the weeks to follow will include Opal Lee Berryman's Pioneer Preacher on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri. Stay tuned.